Bram Stoker's Dracula is an example of the genre known as invasion literature. And this genre is identified as starting in 1871 with the publication of a short story called The Battle of Dorking and continuing up to the First World War. And it's characterised by a concentration on British fears of foreign invasion, either by direct military means or by underhand subversive ones. And the enemy is usually Germany, sometimes France. At other times the enemy is not quite so clearly defined. Dracula falls into the latter group. He's clearly an outsider who is dangerous to the safety and welfare of British society. He is associated with infection and degeneracy, and the threat he poses is racial and moral. Uh, some critics have argued that he's representative of the oppressed peoples within the British Empire, coming back to haunt and destroy that empire from its very heart. It's a plausible theory, but one I think that is incorrect. Dracula himself, for instance, is not from any of the countries that form part of the British Empire. He's not from India, North America, Africa, Australasia or China. In fact, he's from the furthest eastern edge of Europe, an area which, uh, even if regarded then as utterly strange and perhaps barbarous, is still nevertheless Europe. So if he doesn't represent this kind of alien threat, what kind does he represent? The answer seems simple and quite obvious. He represents the age-old figure of the Jew, the perpetual outsider, the wandering Jew, the Jew of anti-Semitic folklore, the Jew who carries pestilence and filth and is always seeking to undermine Christendom. Now, it's well to remember the ingrained anti-Semitism of Europe at the time. Few people would be concerned about making anti-Jewish comments in public or depicting anti-Jewish characters in their books. Fagin in Oliver Twist, for example, is nearly always just called the Jew rather than Fagin. In Wilde's picture of Dorian Gray, the author is at pains to make sure we know that the manager of the theatre in which Sybil Vane plays is Jewish. And at the same time, that is the late 19th century, large numbers of Eastern European Jews were coming into London, fleeing from the pogroms in Russia and Poland. It's estimated that up to 150,000 of them settled in London, predominantly in the East End. There was no other ethnic or foreign community of that size in Britain at the time, and none so visible, distinguished as they were by their dress, their religion, customs, language and professions. Indeed, such was the popular resentment of them that in 1905 Parliament passed the Aliens Act, which gave the Home Secretary powers to restrict immigration. So how does this relate to Dracula? Well, if you look at how he is portrayed, you soon begin to see telltale signs. His physical characteristics are those of the stereotypical Jew, bushy eyebrows, prominent nose, eyes that are sometimes fiery red, sometimes shifty or hypnotic. He has bad odour and rank breath. His fingers are ugly or claw-like his ears pointed. is usually dressed from head to toe in black. As for his psychological and social characteristics, he is loyal only to his tribe, in this case the CK, despite his desire to assimilate. Dracula's desire to learn as much as he can about London and England, for instance, is purely so that he can embed himself within society in order to corrupt it. He is cosmopolitan, a word often used as code for Jew, and he has the gift of adaptability and is able to turn himself into other animal forms. He is also a sexual predator, preying on women, and yet at times is somewhat sexually ambiguous. There is that disturbing image of him with Mina drinking blood from his chest, as if he were breastfeeding her. At one point he receives a wound on his forehead from Jonathan Harker, a wound that stays on him like the mark of Cain, designating him an outcast. He is avaricious and greedy for money, one of the oldest and most distinguished clichés of anti-Semitism. Jonathan Harker finds a pile of 
dusty gold in his castle. And when Jonathan and the others are pursuing him in London, he slashes Dracula's sleeve, which immediately seems to bleed gold and money. So greedy for it is Dracula that he even attempts to snatch some of it up as he flees. Everything to do with Christianity revolts him. Its signs and symbols, the crucifix, holy water and so on. And so he loves to desecrate old Christian grounds with his presence. His coffin, for instance, is stored in what used to be a crypt. And one of the clearest indication, uh, indications of Dracula's identity with the Jew is the importance of blood. Human blood is of the essence to Dracula. And it's no coincidence that Jews have been described as bloodsuckers, as parasites bleeding society dry. At the heart of this bloodlust, however, is the blood libel. The blood libel is the accusation that Jews sacrifice Christians, particularly children, in order to drink their blood and use it in ritual meals. There are numerous blood libel tales across Europe and the Middle East, including the story of Little Saint Hugh of Lincoln, which is mentioned in the Prioress's Tale in Chaucer. The irony of this is that in Judaism, the consumption of blood is absolutely forbidden. This libel is presented in the book in two forms. And the first is the straightforward drinking of the blood of victims. The second is in the attacks by Lucy on children in order to drink their blood a very clear manifestation of the old blood libel. And when Tricilla is fleeing London, only one person helps him, Emmanuel Hildesheim, described as a Hebrew of rather the Adelphi theatre type, with a nose like a sheep. In other words, another Jew, a stereotypical stage one at that. So Dracula does indeed embody a generalised contemporary fear of decay and ge degeneration of a lessening of national moral strength which could lead to collapse. But in choosing the Jew as the model on which to build him, Stoker acknowledges that far from being the early stirrings of imperial guilt, this is more to do with continuing an ancient racial and religious prejudice.